Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you. You know, even going back centuries, before amplification, before all this technology, then, people would gather in intimate spaces and share an evening. When kids come outside to play at Wild Rock, it just shuffles up that social structure, and we're all friends here. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard, and this is Charlottesville Inside Out. just a funky, deep-nick kind of place back in the day, and then it's evolved over time and has sustained itself into providing to our community what we've got going on here tonight. Today we're going to hear about an acoustic music series that started in Charlottesville back in the mid-60s. The organization took a hiatus in 2006, but came back strong in 2014 with an impressive seasonal roster of national and regional acts. Join us as we catch up with a few of the volunteers who helped to bring the Prism Coffee House back to the community. Come on! The real emphasis of the PRISM is on presenting concerts in a listening room environment. So people go there to listen to the music. They're not there to drink beer, to socialize. They're there, and they do that as well. But the they main do. focus is on sitting and listening. And a lot of our artists say to us afterwards, this is the kind of show I really want to do because this is the show where people are there to listen to me. Name some of the acts that you all have seen throughout the years at the PRISM before starting it back up again? Well, Mike Seeger, certainly, who had his annual Breaking Up Christmas show there, Tony Rice, uh, Ralph Stanley. Peter uh, Rowan. Yeah, John Annie Doyle. Harris was there for 75 I mean, cents. Yeah, she did two shows back in the early 70s. In, and, and, in and her early of, career. A lot of Celtic acts, too. Yeah, like, incredible. Uh, Lunasa made their first appearance in Charlottesville at the Prison Coffee House. Dave Matthews played there yeah, in the yeah. early 90s. Yeah, Dave and Tim Reynolds, yeah. Talk about um, how often you have shows. What is, how long is the series we do annually? We 15 shows a season. We have two seasons, spring and, and fall. Uh, we do 10 to 15 shows a season. So we do 20 to 30 shows a year. The Seville Coffee's been a wonderful location. Uh, they have food and beverages, and it's a nice atmosphere. It's intimate, but friendly. Uh, and we've been very happy there. Talk about the different styles of traditional music that come through. We've got a Scandinavian group coming in, the Nordic Fiddlers Block, and we just had Vessen in last year. So we, we bring in acts from around the world. We've got to be one of the longest operating coffee houses in, on the East Coast, if not the whole United States. The quality of the music was always really top notch. And you could see things you couldn't see anywhere else. The whole interior was like wood, wooden floors, wooden walls with nice paintings on the walls. So it had a very homey, warm atmosphere and we had refreshments in the kitchen. When we started drawing even a hundred people, it was very crowded and tight, but People loved it, it was fine. We play all kinds of venues, you know, from large to small, and it's a lot of it's about people. People, I get a kick out of folk, you know. I've got a little bit of EQ on the room, but your, your channel is flat. Why don't we listen to her with the reverb and, all right, so. Peter, tell us a little bit about the history of the Prism Coffee House. Well, it started back in 1966. Students wanted to get away from the university grounds and have a place where they could talk against the war and 
amongst themselves. And so they approached the Westminster Presbyterian Church over there on the corner of Gordon and Rugby. And the ministers came together, they called themselves the God Squad, and set up that space for the students. And it started in 66, and they had their own concerts, and then they started to evolve into having folks like John Jackson and Emmy Lou Harris come in. And in the mid-80s, a group from the PRISM made it into a nonprofit organization, and then around 1990, 91, they made it into a weekly series, and acts from all over the world started coming in, not, not just folk, but you'd have blues, jazz, classical, folks like Matt Heimovitz would come in and do concerts, Peter Rowan, Tony Trishka, and it went that way until 2006, and the church was ready to take their space back, and so the PRISM kind of lost its home for a few years, but it still managed to stay alive. It's a small, intimate venue, and you feel like you can just be friends with these folks, and they bring world-class music to a local community. It's just fantastic. It's phenomenal to see it in Seville Coffee because it's so small, and I'm gonna be like three feet away from them while they play. I'm very excited. <laughs> What a joy it is to play this music. I mean, hopefully that comes across as an honest, it's a privilege. We love gatherings, and the fiddle is a great motivator. Um, it's a great thing to gather around. Let's talk a little bit about the musical role that you play in our community, so people sort of have an understanding of why you're so passionate about being behind this. Chris Munson, you're involved in everything. <laughs> in the Charlottesville music scene? It's, it's been a long time. Uh, I, I started booking bands in my fraternity at, at UVA in 1980, and I've been involved with uh, concert promotion, and I had my own booking agency, uh, Rising Tide Productions. I worked at Tracks back in the early days and toured with several national and international acts doing uh, live sound and production, and have continued to be involved with all different kinds of music in Charlottesville for, since 1980. And Pete, yes. Bando Mafia, you've Talk about your connection in the music in the music scene in Charlottesville. Well, I, I came to sh I came back to Charlottesville in 1985, and in about 1989, joined the Mando Mafia or helped form the Mando Mafia. And over the course of 20 years, probably every year we played at the Prism. So I have a deep affection for the Prism. Around the same time, Fred Boyce recruited me to uh, be a DJ at WTJU. So I got my finger on a lot of different pulses of what's going on yeah. in the music. And you know, my involvement with both WTJ and the Prism started with Mando Mafia. I was driving down Rugby Road and a friend said, hey, turn on this radio station. We're going to go to this venue. And, and so the first sounds I ever heard coming out of the Prism were on WTJU and it was Mando Mafia. I, I, love, the, I love all of the connections. Um, and, and you are the director of, of the, I'm folk the folk program. director, yeah, and live music at WTJU, the university's radio station. You're bringing in just top notch artists. Name some of the artists that have come through since the prison has restarted. Certainly Alistair and Fraser and Natalie Haas have been Pierre a ben big Susan. part of it. Yeah, Pierre Ben Susan, uh, Beth Gambetta, mm -hmm. Dry Branch Fire Squad. And Molly Tuttle? Is Molly, Molly Tuttle, Tuttle, yeah. So talk about her because when you booked her she had not won. No, no. We booked Molly Tuttle before she won the IBMA uh, guitar Player of the Year Award, First which woman was to last, win. last year, and as soon as we booked her, we started selling tickets, and they sold like wildfire, and we sold out way quicker than we'd sold out for any other show. And see, this reminds me of the early days of the prison, because there were a lot of people who came through and played a small listening room for the first time Gillian at and the Dave. prison. Gillian, Gillian Welch. Welch. Well, you know, the first yes. time Gillian and Dave played there was in 95, and there were 12, sometimes people say 13. I was there. And six months later, the place was packed, and then two years later, for the folk marathon, they were going to play for two hours, but people just kept pouring in, and they ended up playing for four hours, and they only stopped because they said, we don't know any more tunes. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that, that's oh, what I love what about the prism. And, and I think this goes to the great booking people that we have doing the booking for the prison. They have vision, they're looking for that next thing coming along. We sort of have two mission statements. One is to bring what might be missed by the commercial venues to the Charlottesville audience. And then our second one is to help the artists that are playing this kind of music that is not necessarily highly commercial, give them a place to play in a town the size of Charlottesville. So I am in charge of managing the email account for the booking committee, so all the inquiries that come in, I kind of sort through them and send on the ones that seem promising. I book the acts, help negotiate contracts and then set up all the details for that. And then I've helped some running the door for the actual shows and set up and this and that. The board is, is basically the staff. That's without the reverb, so let me bring in a little yeah. bit of reverb. I want to make sure I don't have too much. Is that right? Not too much? Yeah. Not too long? Yeah. Okay. So if people in our community want to get involved in some way because it's all volunteer, what, what are some of the opportunities they might have? What, what could they get involved in and how would they go about doing that? Well, they can learn about sound. They can learn about handling promotion, social media for us. We're yeah. always looking for new people to join and new ideas and people Great can help people with at the door to take a wide the variety. Tickets. Come on in and, and chat with us at a show one night. We'll be happy to chat with you or go to our website and, and give us a holler and we'll be happy to get people involved. And what's really cool too is for ticketing. People can go online and get their tickets in advance. You don't even have, at the moment, you have no processing fee. And most of the money goes to the artists since we're a volunteer. That's the other thing is, you know, we're all volunteers so we have minimal overhead expenses and most of the money goes directly to the artists. It's really important, I think, to preserve acoustic music and roots music and world music and indigenous music and so this is an opportunity for people who continue to play this kind of music to have a stage and, and an audience. I think the audience that come here have chosen this, you know, they, they've, they come here because they, they like what's going on, they like the environment, they like that intimacy and in so many ways this kind of music is designed for that. So what do you see in the future for the prison? More shows. More shows, more shows. Yeah, for me it's uh, making sure that traditional and beyond music will always have a home in Charlottesville. Yeah. Oh, this is wonderful, you all. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing and for all the great music you're bringing to Charlottesville. Thank you. Well, it's our pleasure. <laughs>of you notice that big giant creature behind me that's a salamander they're kind of like lizards but they like to be in water research shows that time spent in nature helps us to be happier healthier and more creative within five minutes of connecting to the natural world our stress levels drop yet children on average spend less than seven minutes a day outdoors Today we're going to explore a special place in our community that is dedicated to changing those numbers. Join us as we visit Wild Rock. Come on. Wait, first let's see what else there is to see. Come on, follow this Michael man. Here we go. The nature experiences that we offer here at Wild Rock are essential experiences that every child should experience throughout their lifetime. Standing beside a stream and watching the water flow, looking up at a mountain, running through a wide open field of natural meadow. These are essential experiences that really help benefit a child's social and emotional health and well-being. And unfortunately, so many children today, even children right here in our area, do not have that kind of access to this mm -hmm. wide open green space. And this is named after Wild Rock, this huge rock 
that's up on the hill in the back. Yeah, we have one of our trails goes right past an amazing lookout point. And right at the corner, um, before you enter the forest, you get to the top of the hill and there's this gigantic boulder in the ground and children love to climb up. From the top of it, you can see this amazing bird's eye view of the entire playscape, have a great vista of Fox Mountain behind us. And it really gives oh. children a sense of empowerment. They climb up there and they do their King of the Mountain pose. Huh? And then the, the rocks in the front, the, there's a whole maze. So that's our walking labyrinth. The primary goal is to encourage reflection and meditation and slowing down the body and looking at the world from different perspectives as you follow uh, the winding path through the labyrinth. Kids always run on it though. How could you not? Welcome to Wild Rock. You guys look so excited to play here. Talk about what students have been doing here today. So today we had um, preschoolers from Jackson Via Elementary and they came out to Wild Rock as part of our Nature Friends program. Every single preschooler in the Charlottesville City Public Schools will come out twice and engage in free play in our playscape. Um, in addition to that, we're gonna be visiting the children at their schools four times throughout the year. And that is so fantastic. So they come out here and we'll talk about all of the different things they can do, but then you all go to them and show them what's right in their backyard at their school. Absolutely. We want to impress upon the teachers and the students and the families that you don't need to drive out far distances or go to a remote location in order to have these meaningful nature play experiences. Really just small amounts of nature and finding pockets of nature in your own home and around your school or workplace or community can have such a positive impact on child development and emotional well-being. Yeah, and when you say is nature friend, what does that mean when you're talking to students and you're teaching them about that? What does it mean? Well, first of all, we want students to feel at home in nature. We want them to be comfortable in nature so they continue to see nature as a potential resource for them throughout their lives. And to do that, we introduce them to our nature friends who are the animals and insects that live around us. Not only does this help their comfort level, but it sort of is a uh, precursor to stewardship where the preschoolers are able to feel connected to the natural world and be invested in conservation and taking care of our natural resources. Yeah, tell us about the nature pyramid. The nature pyramid is similar to the food pyramid. It was developed by Tim Beatley and it's a triangle of your nature experiences that you need throughout your lifetime. Um, at the bottom of the pyramid, these are nature experiences that you need on a daily or hourly basis. This is a view out your window of nature or having a plant inside your office. Right. Um, and then there's experiences where you're going on a nature hike. And maybe that's not every day, but hopefully maybe it could be once a week. And then there are immersive nature experiences, like a place like Wild Rock, where you can come and really spend an entire day and immerse in nature and nature play and free play. And then at the tippy top of that pyramid, it's, it's the sort of once in a lifetime experience where you disconnect from society and all together for a two week period. And so Tim Beatley's pyramid just sort of gives you a, a daily reminder of incorporating nature throughout your day, throughout your week, throughout your month, throughout your year. Yummy! Okay, what's next? I had lots of fun with the kids there, and I shared it with the kids at my kitchen. I was making some soup. Soup. I watched this much fun. She came in just this morning talking about how excited she was when she woke up because she knew she was going to Wild Rock. And I'm sure when we get back this afternoon, that's all they're going to talk about, what they did with the stream, with the animals, how they got to dress up and just the excitement of the day. Educating uh, the whole child is a huge piece of our mission uh, because we are not just taking care of their brain, we're taking care of their gross motor development, social emotional development, and what better way to do that and through their play skills in the natural wilderness, so to speak. We are in Martha's Meadow, This right? is Martha's Meadow so at Wild Rock. Tell us just really quickly why it is called Martha's Meadow. So Martha's Meadow was named in honor of a close friend of Carolyn Schuyler. And Carolyn, Carolyn is Schuyler is our founder and executive director. And her close friend, Martha Russell, was just connected so deeply to nature and children and community yeah. and family. And as she was battling ovarian cancer, 
Carolyn was in the development process of Wild Rock. And so Carolyn really wanted Wild Rock to be a place, not only that Martha could be honored at the end of her life, but also to create a space where Martha's two daughters could have an opportunity to come and feel that connection to their mother. Oh, she would love this. <laughs> so let's talk about the different stations that you have. So right here we have, it's sort of a little animal doctor's office, right? That's right, that's our wildlife rescue center. And part of nature play that we have here at Wild Rock is really honing in on that social emotional development. And so we have foxes and brown bears and deer, and the students can come and, and pretend that an animal has injured a leg or has injured a wing, and so they can practice those nurturing skills that are so important for early child development. And then you have, well, you have a stream running through. The stream is always one of the most popular spots. The kids are pretending to fish. They have their nets. Absolutely. And playing in the mud. Yep. And we're a catch and release stream here, so mm -hmm. we make sure that we observe the fish and then release them back into the stream. On beautiful days, it's hard to get the kids out of the water for sure. Oh, I bet. All right, so what else is here? So we have a creation stage where the children can play dress up, um, and you can put on a pair of butterfly wings or a foxtail, and it's amazing to see them really transforming themselves and their play. And they love the salamander. It's the biggest, largest salamander I've ever seen. It's amazing. So the salamander is in the center of our log obstacle course because obviously gross motor play is such an important part of what we do here at Wild Rock and nature play in general. And the salamander is always a huge hit. And you have a barn here, so there are activities inside as well They all that all relate to nature. Tell us about a few of those. So we were so lucky to have Building Goodness Foundation come and do so much of our construction here at Wild Rock. Um, they did a lot of the work inside the barn and created a really amazing space for us to bring loose parts play into our programming here at Wild Rock. So what is loose parts play? Loose parts play is a really important facet of early childhood development. It's when you give children loose parts. It could be sticks and rocks and pine cones and branches and as many natural materials as you can find and then you see what happens. The best part is it builds confidence because with loose parts play there's no wrong way to play. You come to cook some food? We're making all different sorts of stuff today. I think it's important for our children to be able to get outside of their home environment, the Charlottesville City proper area and realize that there are mountains just outside their backyard, so to speak, and the world is bigger than their street or their apartment complex or their neighborhood. Play on the salamander. I was building sandcastle. I've never seen him get so active into using the nets and trying to catch things. He usually isn't interested in stuff like that, so it was good to see him do that and interact with all the other kids. So today we're seeing preschoolers, but you have elementary school students, you have middle school students, uh -huh. you have seniors, mm -hmm. and then you have businesses that come through and they, they have ecotherapy retreats. One of my favorite programs that we have here is when seniors come from the Mary Williams Senior Center. They have play tray activities where they're given natural materials, where they can create expressive art. We often try to schedule those visits for the same time that a preschool visit is going on oh. because the interaction of mm -hmm. the groups from two opposite ends of this age spectrum is just so beneficial for both groups. Yeah, intergenerational free play. Absolutely. That's fa you, Absolutely. You can't beat that. And then talk about, I mean, we have local nonprofits and businesses who come out here and this is where they have their retreats. So one of the things that we're really committed to is ensuring that the social service providers of our community are taking the time to focus on their own self-care. So we welcome the staff themselves to come out for a retreat and to share their learning experiences and to share their challenges, creating a safe place of self-care here in nature. We've worked with Big Brothers Big Sisters and Sarah, which is a sexual assault resource agency and the Women's Initiative. Wild Rock is open to the public too. You have set hours and you have to make an appointment, right? So we're open to the public during the school year on Saturdays and then throughout the summer, um, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And the reason we require reservations is because we want Wild Rock to keep that wide open, wild and free feeling. But our admission is pay what you can right. because we don't want costs to ever be an obstacle in 
individuals and families coming out and enjoying the nature programming that we offer here at Wild Rock. And I know you've, uh, you've been able to get a lot of the work done here through Bama Works grants. You have volunteers. Talk about how important it is, that the community being behind this. This has been such a labor of love for hundreds of volunteers. Um, I mentioned Building Goodness, UVA, and local church groups. And also, all of our materials inside the barn have been donated by volunteers who have just really shared their strengths and their creativity and their passion for providing this nature experience opportunity for the people of our community. Is it echoing? Go, hello, hello. Oh, they are creating, they are exploring, they are enjoying, and they are just loving nature. It's different for me. I'm a city girl, so <laughs> I liked it a lot. Um, getting a little bit dirty is fun, but yeah, just interacting with everybody's been a good day. That's it for this week. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard. Join us next time on Charlottesville Inside Out. Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you.